Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, there's a Zoom function to this. Uh, so for all of those who are tuning in on Facebook Live, uh, if you are enjoying this conversation, please join us uh, over on Zoom for the small group discussion and the large group wrap up. Um, as I mentioned, there's going to be an opportunity to register. Uh, I'll put that link here in the comments shortly. And um, without further ado, I will um, uh, I will be uh, giving over a, share, a screen share function for Father Frank. Um, so Father Frank, uh, before you begin, um, like I mentioned, I'll give an introduction. Um, but while I'm also doing that, I'm going to stop sharing and then give you um, the ability to share your screen as well. So let me- Thank you, Casey. Absolutely. Can I get a thumbs up just to make sure everybody sees um, his slides? Thank you. Okay. Okay. So Father Frank Donio, SAC, is a member of the Palatine Fathers and Brothers. He is director of the Catholic Apostolic Center in Washington, DC. He also teaches and does pastoral work part-time at the Catholic University of America. The Catholic Apostolate Center works with the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops on some of their evangelization projects, particularly related to missionary discipleship. Thank you, Father Frank, for being here with us. And without further ado, um, I look forward to hearing your presentation on evangelization. Thank you, Casey, and thank you all. It's a very great blessing to be with you tonight, and thank you for the opportunity to, to do this. So we're going to be talking about missionary discipleship and evangelization, and I'm not going to drone on and on. I, I have a, a fairly short presentation, and then I'm, I look forward to, to the discussion that we're going to be having over the, over the course of the time, and also to the witness that, that Father John is going to give, because not being, uh, I'm the son of a Marine, and that's about as close as I've gotten in terms of the, the connection with the, uh, with the military. And um, the, uh, the Archdiocese, though, we've had a lot of collaboration of different types over the years. And so we're always happy as Catholic Apostolate Center to support the efforts of the Archdiocese for the military services. So we're going to talk about missionary discipleship and evangelization. You're probably, of course, being in, you know, as, as Catholics, we certainly have heard this term evangelization. Missionary discipleship is maybe a little bit of a, it's a newer term that has come into the Catholic lexicon over the last several years, particularly in, in the pontificate of Pope Francis, but really it means a disciple. Of course, we've certainly heard of discipleship, a follower of Christ who is sent. Now, there's another term for that. Uh, it's a lowercase apostle, lowercase a apostle. Uppercase a apostle means, of course, the success, the, the 12 who were chosen and others who have that bear that name, including St. Paul, but also then the successors to the apostles, the bishops. And so, but a missionary disciple is someone who is, as I said, a follower who is sent out into the world, out into daily life, into their families, into life situations, wherever we find ourselves, but also where do we, where are we in our encounter with Christ? How are we sharing in the mission of Christ? So we're accompanied by Christ. We're accompanied by Jesus Christ. Of course, we just have, have celebrated and we're within the Christmas season and we have the, the word who's become flesh. He's come into our world. Uh, of course, we fast forward to Easter we and even further to the to uh, Ascension and Pentecost. He leaves a mission, and we're called to be a part of that mission, but he's accompanying us, and this is the road to Emmaus. He's walking with us. He's teaching us. He is, we have encountered him, but sometimes we may not recognize him, and or maybe there's been a time in our lives where we didn't recognize him, or there are people around us who don't recognize him. And so he's accompanying us and we're also called to accompany others to him. And then let's be clear about that. That's what we're doing. When we're talking about evangelization. 
we are accompanying others to life in Christ. And as Catholic evangelization, we're talking about doing that in and through his church. Because it's not one of these separate kinds of me and Jesus types of things. When we talk about evangelization as Catholics, when we talk about our life in Christ as Catholics, it's always done in and through his church because the church has been left to continue his mission until he comes again. And we as baptized are baptized into life in Christ in and through his church. And so therefore that mission is also ours. Now, each of us have different roles in that mission, different ways in which we're called to live that, that mission, but we are all called to that as baptized, and we're called also to help others recognize that and to encounter Christ in their daily lives. Just a little bit of background of how this conversation has been, been going in the United States, first starting with the apostolic exhortation of Pope Francis called Evangelii Gaudium. So since St. Paul the, uh, the Sixth, back in the, the mid-1970s, there was a document called Evangelii Nuntiandi, in which the, we, we, talk, we started to talk more and more about evangelization. Of course, the church has been doing this for hundreds of years. I belong to an order called the Palatine Fathers and Brothers. We're a missionary community, and we're also, we assist in reviving the faith of Catholics, helping everyone become an apostle. This is something that, that the church has been doing for centuries, but this, this focus on evangelization and then what we call what St. John Paul II called new evangelization, the focus on this is also not only on, on the proclamation to those who have not heard, but also to those who are in need of ongoing evangelization, historically maybe have been Catholic. And so how do we assist in that? Or assisting our brothers and sisters who maybe don't, not only don't know Christ, but they don't necessarily know his church. And so we assist them in, in coming to understand and in coming to live. Now, there's a distinction that I'll make in a moment between proselytism proselytizing and evangelization. There's a very clear distinction between the two that was emphasized, per, especially by Pope Benedict. Pope Emeritus Benedict, uh, St. John Paul II coined the term new evangelization, and he spoke about being new in methods, new in order. It's not a, a, an evangelization that somehow, oh, we, did, we didn't do it right the first time. Instead, we, we need to redouble our efforts. We need to get out there, especially to those who have not been, been a part of, of Catholic life. And especially, particularly those who have been baptized as Catholics. Then we look at Pope Emeritus Benedict, who had a synod on the new evangelization right before um, he left office as, as Pope. And when Pope Francis came, came in that summer, he released a, an apostolic exhortation called the joy of the gospel or even jelly gaudium. And in that we see this term missionary discipleship. And it's really taking all of these things from St. Paul VI all the way up to his own pontificate, putting them together and, and calling the church to moving outward, that we're called to go forth. If you really want to understand Pope Francis and the way in which he does things, read Evangelii Gaudium, because everything that he has done since, and he has talked about this, is really found in there. It's, it's very interesting if you look at that, but, it's, but we have to look at this, this understanding of evangelization over these last, these last few decades, particularly. The church in the United States had very, has had various uh, initiatives that it's held, uh, the Convocation of Catholic Leaders, the Quinto Encuentro, the National Dialogue. These are all things that were around, uh, how are we living as missionary disciples in a variety of contexts and in a variety of ways. The National Dialogue focused primarily on young adults, youth and young adults. And then the, the conference issued a document the Catholic Apostolate Center was involved in developing called Living as Missionary Disciples, a Resource for Evangelization. And it gave some ways in which to be able to, to live and, and to be a missionary disciple. Uh, it's, it wasn't a program, but instead gave some principles and a methodology that I'll talk about in a few moments. So the difference between an evangelizer, you know, evangelizer, not proselytizer. This comes from Christus Vivit, the uh, post-synodal apostolic exhortation on the church, voca on, excuse me, the faith, um, vocational discernment, and young people. 
And when we look at this, we see, and this is where this symposium is also lifting out of as an effort to, to live this in, in a particular way within the Archdiocese for Military Services. We look at this, that in Christus Viva, it talks about the, the mentor, but really this is also about the evangelizer. The evangelizer's balance, this is not, we're not about being fanatics. Now that doesn't mean we don't stand for the truth but it means that we're not called to be fanatical. We're called to have a balance in which we're willing to listen to other people. And by listening, that means that patient walking with people. Sometimes it's going walking, you know, Jesus with the, on the road to Emmaus was walking in the wrong direction, away from Jerusalem, but he let them walk. And then when they came, they ran back to Jerusalem. They ran back to the community when they really, really came to that encounter with Jesus in the breaking of the bread. The calling to be a person of faith and of prayer. We can say a lot of things. We can know a lot of things about the, the, about the faith. But have we had and do we have a personal encounter with Christ? Pope Benedict uh, particularly emphasized this. Personal encounter with Christ and especially in the Eucharist real presence of Christ. And so therefore, in our prayer, our personal prayer and our communal prayer, but also know our own weaknesses and frailties, our own sinfulness, our own, uh, the things that, that, that hold us back from living as full of a life in Christ as we can, and sometimes can be a counter witness if we're not careful. The proselytizer, though, is very sure of her himself, and they they go forth, and they just simply want people to come into. And maybe we've encountered that with some of our other Christian brothers and sisters, and in a in a pluralistic environment, uh, at times it can be challenging. But it, it especially as we'll talk about a little later, it's in word and deed, and especially in our deeds, but also in our words that we then are able to evangelize. And so our mission is a sharing in Christ's mission. It's not our personal mission. It's his mission. We're sim simply sharing in it. And we need to be also very clear about that. We're sharing in his mission. And so when we, when we lose clarity about that and we start making it our mission, then we're, we're destined not only for failure, but it's a, it's a very dangerous situation that we placed ourselves in because we are not Christ. And so therefore we have to always center ourselves on him. Missionary discipleship, uh, there are, it's, there's a, a fourfold methodology that, that is in living as mis missionary disciples. And by methodology, it means the way in which Christ, uh, Christ went about the, the way in which the people came to encounter him and then to, to live and then he sent them. They came into the, an encounter with him. He accompanied them. So come and see, follow me. Then there was the life in community, which is very central in Catholic uh, understanding. And then we're sent. Now, there are different ways in which one can enter into this. Maybe I don't realize that I'm encountering Christ. It may be that I'm being accompanied by somebody who is, uh, who is a, a follower of Christ, who, who uh, understand, but is, is patiently walking with me. And then I come to that encounter, similar to the road to Emmaus and the breaking of the bread. Or maybe I, I've gone into the community of faith. I've gone to mass and there's something about mass. There's something about the, the, the worship that, it, that is occurring, the, the beauty uh, and, and the solemnity of the mass and, and the, the way in which the, the people and their reverence with the, of the Eucharist. And, and so what is it about that? And then they come to a greater understanding or maybe they've been sent, maybe they've been engaged in service with us in some way. But ultimately, all four of these will make an appearance usually. So let's look at one of them. One of, the, uh, one of them is encounter. See, come and see. Well, the purpose of evangelization is to lead people to encounter Christ. We need to be clear about that. That's what we're doing. We're leading people to have a greater encounter with Christ. And so we accompany them. And, and this is where Jesus has said, follow me. So the response to the encounter with Christ needs accompaniment. This is accompaniment of the community. This is accompaniment that can occur in families. This is accompaniment that can, can occur in all sorts of places. But it does need to be intentional. 
it, 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 if we, there's also accompaniment that occurs with the communion of saints. How many people have read lives of the saints or have, ha, have entered into the scriptures or have come to experience uh, through the, again, the church's liturgy. And it's a form of accompaniment that does occur. And into this community, the community, you know, the body of Christ. And this is a bold statement, which is the Catholic Church. We need to be clear about that Catholic evangelization is, again, always done in and through the church. And so that's not to, to lessen uh, other, other Christian communities. It is simply to say that when we are going about evangelization, there, there is the element always of the community of faith. And our, our theology and our teachings are always centered and rooted, our sacramental uh, understanding, always in, in and through the community of faith, the church. And there, therefore, we're sent. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. But, you know, we remember that they were kind of looking up into the air and, and that, you know, men of Galilee, why are you just standing there? And we're told this at the end of Mass, though, go. But how often do we go? go out and, and accept God's desire to, to be sent on mission. This is what God is calling us to, to go out, to be on mission, to go and, and proclaim him in what we say and in what we do through the witness of our lives. We can teach, we can say a number of things, but if we're not living it, people will notice that. And they'll take great notice of it. And they can de-evangelize if we're not careful. But remember, we have to remember that just as in, in that Pentecost that occurred, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the Blessed Mother, the apostles, the other disciples who were gathered in the cenacle, the upper room, this is all dependent on the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it's not dependent on us. We cooperate with God, but it's not dependent on us. It's dependent on the Holy Spirit. And so we are, we are given that strength, that ability as temples of the Holy Spirit to go forth. But it also means looking at ourselves and seeing where we are not cooperating with God, the, the moments, the, the situations, the sinfulness, the things that, that we're called to live more authentically, life in Christ. And the Holy Spirit can guide us in coming to that understanding and life in the church and particularly the sacraments, especially the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, the sacrament and then the Eucharist. So in Christus Vivid, and so we had the synod the, on, on young people, the faith and vocational discernment. Out of that came the post synodal apostolic exhortation, Christus Vivid. And if we look at that, it says young friends, and you know, this might seem a little condescending. Again, we have to look at the language. Uh, this was written originally in, in, uh, in Spanish and then Italian, and then it makes it into English. So it can sound a little strange. But the rest of it, don't wait until tomorrow to contribute your energy, your audacity, and your creativity to changing our world. Your youth is not an in-between time. You are the now of God and he wants you to bear fruit. Now, remember that this was written for, uh, with a focus on, on people who are in from late teens up to, up to late twenties. And so th this is, the, the focus is on that in terms of the, when looking at young adults, of course, in the United States, we look at young adults as people in their um, from 18 to 39. But the, the point being, sometimes keep, people keep going on about the future of the church. We have to recognize this is the now of the church. And I think particularly in military service, there's, this, is, this is very true because there's so many people who are in that, that age range that we're talking about. So the now of the church. And so therefore the vocation that we have, this call that we have, we need to look at in a broader sense Pope Francis says, including the call to life, the call to friendship with him, the call to holiness and so forth. And so our whole life has to be in relation to God who loves us and to realize that nothing is the result of pure chance. And that's where the Holy Spirit, we have to look at and to see where the Holy Spirit is moving and active in our lives, but that everything in our lives can become a way of responding to the Lord except for the things that hold us back from him. Because the Lord has a wonderful plan for us. 
And so that call means then to be, be sent uh, on mission. But we, we are accompanied by Jesus Christ and accompany others to him in and through the church. And so we start with self. And then we can accompany others. Where, where am I in my life in Christ? Where am I in my life in the community of faith, the church? Where am I in going outward to others? Maybe within our families, among our friends, among those who, who are our co-workers. Where does that happen? And so words and deeds. Sometimes in Catholic circles, it's, it's difficult. The words part sometimes is difficult because we don't want to come across uh, in, a, in a negative way, or maybe we kind of keep it very private, our faith. But when we're going through difficult times, it's in those deeds or it's in those moments where we're getting through something that is seemingly to others very challenging and very difficult. And they ask, well, where are you getting that from? It's our faith. But it doesn't, there's also that active, you know, in, this, in our service, particularly through the uh, corporal works of mercy and through our care, especially for the poor and the suffering, the, the vulnerable, those who are in need. We do it out of our faith. And then also our words. When people do ask, we, we do need to be knowledgeable in our faith. And to take that time. Now, we're never going to, uh, to exhaust the, the richness that is Catholicism. It's we're ever learning. But it is important for us to know uh, what the teachings is, of our faith are and to, to be able to articulate. But to walk with people in their questions. Sometimes you may ask, well, why are they asking this question? Sometimes it may be because they have a very particular reason why they're asking that question that may seem theological or catechetical or whatever and have a, an answer. And they're not looking really for a pat answer. They're looking maybe for our walking with them, accompanying them. And then we can, we can as, he, you know, as Jesus did on the road to Emmaus, he accompanied, he listened, he asked, he just took time to listen, and then he taught. And then they came to the Eucharist, and it all became clear to them. And they ran back. He disappeared and they continued that mission. And this is the mission that we are, we are called to because he doesn't really disappear. He's, he's there with us, present, alive. Christ is vivid. He's alive. Christ is alive in our lives right now. And so what we have experienced in Christ, we are called to share. So I just want to just offer some of those as, as just a, a few thoughts um, to, to get our, our conversation going. Um, they're, not, they're certainly not exhausted. I would invite you to go to catholicapostolatecenter.org, and you'll find there a whole section on living as missionary disciples. We did, um, together with the Bishop's Conference, a series of 12 videos uh, that break apart living as missionary disciples that get very practical as well. And then also, uh, a, there's a guide there that's free. All of this stuff is free. The, the videos are on YouTube. And uh, the guide is, is there for, the, for reflection and for discussion. Uh, and just go to that section. And we have a number of, of items around living as missionary disciples. So just to give you a sense of where the church in the United States is focusing particular evangelization effort um, at this time. So thank you. Thank you so much, Father Frank. Um, I really appreciate uh, the ministry that you do and being able to uh, just share that with us. So thank you so much uh, for that and that presentation. Next, we are going to move um, on to, uh, just like we've been doing with this webinar series, we are hearing uh, about the topic and then we go into a witness. And I'm really excited that we have with us today Father John Rudiman, who is a U.S. Air Force chaplain. So um, before he comes on to share his witness, um, I'm going to share uh, a little bit about who he is. Father John Rudiman was born and raised in Washington, D in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. 
went to some went into, into seminary immediately after graduating high school in 2002 and was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Washington in 2010. He began active duty service as an Air Force chaplain in 2013 and has since served at Maelstrom Air Force Base, Great Falls, Montana, Joint Base San Antonio, Texas, Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, and now at Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska. He's passionate about reaching and empowering the young adult population, recognizing their vulnerability and unique challenges, as well as their energy and potential for greatness. Thank you, Father John, uh, for being here with us. And uh, without further ado, Father John. Hey, thanks, Casey. Thanks for putting this together. And um, I do not have an awesome slideshow uh, like Father Frank did, uh, so I don't need to. I, I, I don't have any uh, any screen to share. But um, I uh, let me just pull up some notes here that I do have. Um, First off, just thanks to Father Frank. That um, Father, I don't think I've I've met you yet, but uh, I really enjoyed that presentation, and um, I was really glad to see that uh, that fourfold model that, um, quite frankly, many Protestant denominations uh, are using much better than we are. So I'm glad to see uh, the Catholic Church really getting uh, into that model, um, that fourfold model, right, of of encountering people, accompanying them. Um, inviting them in, that remaining, and then sending. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, much better slides than I could have come up with. So thank you for being here and giving us that, uh, uh, and all of the magisterial documents as well. I think it's important for us, especially in the military, uh, you know, we kind of want to see it in writing. Where, where does it actually say that? Uh, so I appreciate that, Father. Um, so Casey invited me just to give kind of a, a witness to my own experience uh, in working in, in the military as a chaplain and, and doing young adult ministry. It's something I'm super passionate about. Um, as you heard in my little bio, I've been a priest for a little over 10 years now and been an active duty chaplain for a little over seven years now. And so uh, I just have three things that I would share in, in proper Air Force uh, briefing format, I have three points, no more, no less, three points. Um, so I, I have just three things that I would share that I've kind of learned in, in my experience in, in uh, doing young adult ministry uh, and, and um, working with young adults. On the civilian side, in my first uh, three years of priesthood before I went active duty, but then especially now as an active duty chaplain, uh, the first thing uh, which, which dovetails well with what Father Frank was just talking about um, I have found that it can be very helpful when you empower people and in a sense, which you kind of do using that fourfold model that Father Frank was just talking about. If you dump someone, now you have to be very careful about doing this and you can't do this with everyone, but if you take someone and you dump them right into that fourth category of going and sending, if you say, hey, uh, you want a young adult ministry at this parish? Uh, great, you're in charge. Um, and you just dump them right into it. Um, again, you have to be careful who you do that with. You're, you're, you certainly don't want to put someone in charge who, you know, him or herself, uh, you, you maybe, maybe they're not ready to do any kind of leadership. But what we find in the military often is there are a lot of airmen who are uh, kind of itching to lead and to do more. And uh, what I found is if you just kind of empower them from the get go and say, all right, you, you want to do more for the young adults? great, I'll, I'll show up at the events, but you're gonna be in charge of advertising them. You're gonna be in charge of, of uh, you know, getting the purchase requests for the food and, and figuring out where the event's gonna be and booking and all of that. And, and what I found is by kind of dumping someone right in that fourth category of, of going and sending, what you can do is you can actually help them grow in their own relationship with the Lord, really in that, second and third category of, of accompanying them and, and, and inviting them in, just kind of dumping them into the deep end. Again, that model does not work, for, that, that does not work for everyone there, but there is a certain pedagogical wisdom, I think, in saying, okay, you want this, uh, you're in charge now. And, um, and as the priest, I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm going to give you money. I'm going to give you facilities. I'm going to give you the backing of the chaplain corps on base. 
um, to make this an official chaplain corps event and not just something that you came up with as some random uh, member of the military. Uh, the second uh, thing that I found as, as particularly helpful is uh, fellowship. I know that um, as Catholics, we've always struggled with this, right? We, um, we get people to show up to mass, but they come right before mass begins and they leave as soon as mass is over. And it's very difficult nowadays to get Catholics. I think we're getting better at it as a, as a church universal, but to get them to stick around afterwards for something like coffee and donuts, as, as I often would tell my parishioners, um, the, the Sunday obligation is not just to attend mass, it's to come to coffee and donuts afterwards. I mean, that's, that's not officially true. However, um, there's something to be said about the obligation is to be in union and that just as it's good for you to come to mass and hear the readings and hear them unpacked in the homily and to be fed in the Eucharist, there's also something very valuable in being with your brothers and sisters in the faith and, and just getting to shoot the breeze with them and, and have some coffee and, and donuts and, and just to have that fellowship. Um, I would say now, obviously COVID, okay, that's very difficult to do. And we found creative ways to do it during COVID. But even apart from COVID, even before COVID, one of the things that drove me nuts with airmen, um, and I'm sure this is all the branches, not just airmen, but so many of them, even the ones who knew that they had to show up to mass and, and they were maybe just raised that way and they would show up to mass, as soon as it was over, they went back to one of two places, back to the gym to do their fifth workout of the day, right? And they would just have their earbuds in and they'd just be a gym rat, or they go back to their dorm room and they also put their earbuds in and they lock the door and they play video games all day. Um, and I know I kind of sound like an old person to say, hey kids, get off those video games. But like, that is that is pervasive in the in the military. There There is, um, there is so little real connection. And so that fellowship is so important to say, I want you to come to coffee and donuts after mass. Or one of the things that I invited my young adult groups to do often, I, when I got to start a young adult group at my civilian parish, and again, at um, Malmstrom Air Force Base, and most recently at Keesler Air Force Base, uh, sometimes to say, we don't have any formal agenda, we're just going to get together and do dinner. We, we're, we're not going to do a Bible study this time, we're not going to do um, some kind of, uh, you know, particular liturgy or prayer. We're just going to, I just have everyone over at my apartment. We're just going to have dinner and that's it. And there's no, there's no official religious agenda. We're just going to get to know each other and just have a meal. And, and yes, from that will flow, uh, I think more of a willingness to, to then show up to some of those other events that we do. And that gives me to my that leads me to my third point, and then I'll I'll shut up and we'll get to move on with our with our uh, schedule tonight. But uh, my third point, something I've learned just in my years of of um, doing this, uh, is the liturgy. I want to say something about the liturgy. Our Holy Father Pope Francis talks often about accompaniment, right? And Father Frank talked about that. Um, our Holy Father talks about it often, accompaniment, right? And and as I just said, we we can meet people and accompany people everywhere, and we should be. When it comes to meeting the Lord, though, the liturgy is really the privileged place in which we're going to meet the Lord. Um, one of the things that has always kind of driven me nuts as a priest, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something controversial here and throw some of my brother priests under the bus, and maybe even some of my brother chaplains in the military, chaplain priests. I'm not going to name names, don't worry. Um, but but this idea that somehow we know better than the church or that we have to do something to make the liturgy fun and, and attractive and uh, we, we sometimes try to put ourselves above the liturgy um, and, and we, don't, we don't honor it as that privileged place where the Lord is trying to meet us. Um, there's a famous saying that you've heard probably that you can't out Protestant a Protestant, right? You cannot out Protestant a Protestant. Um, Protestant churches will always, always, always have not just better uh, coffee and donuts than us. They'll have a better yoga ministry for their soccer moms. They'll have a better dog sitting ministry uh, for people to sign up and help out a parishioner when they go out of town. 
They're going to have better music. They're always going to have better music. They're always going to have better fog machines. They're always going to have uh, all that. We cannot out Protestant the Protestant. So we need to stop trying. Um, and here's the last thing I'll say on this third point um, about the liturgy being the privileged place of encounter. What I have found, and I'm just speaking from my own experience here, I'm not saying that this is universal by any means, but simply just what I found from my experience is that more and more of the young adult age group, and especially more and more of the young adult age group in the military, are more attracted to the traditional forms of liturgy. Um, the number of times I've had people ask me, hey, Father, when can we do the uh, more Latin during Mass? When can we do more Gregorian chant? When can we do uh, more of the extraordinary form, right? And if we're going to accompany our young adults, then who are we to say, oh, no, you don't really want that. That's not what you want. I'm going to give you more um, fog machines and, and craziness in the sanctuary, right? Um, again, we can't out-Protestant a Protestant. And what I think our young adults are seeing is they're being attracted to those things that the world cannot give. Nowhere else in the world are you going to go and hear Latin. Nowhere else in the world are you going to go and hear Gregorian chant or beautiful polyphony or a reverent liturgy. Um, if, you, if you want just like rock music and fog machines, you can go to a Protestant church or even better, you can go to a civilian concert somewhere, right? Um, so what bothers me is when I run into brother priests who hear young adults asking for these more traditional forms of worship and they, they think that they know better and, oh, I'm not going to do that. Um, and and I, I think that as, as priests, and again, I'm throwing myself and my brother priests on the bus here, I think we need to do better at that, of recognizing the uh, legitimate requests of the, the, the lay faithful. Um, now, again, if, 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 if people are asking us to do all sorts of things that the rubrics do not allow us to do, that's, that's different. But number of times I get asked for more adoration, more Latin, more this. And what it is, is they're looking for things that the world cannot give and that Protestant churches don't and can't give. So um, I just wanted to stir the pot a little bit and leave you guys with something controversial. So that's, that's where I'll wrap it up. But those are the three things really um, that I found just from my experience. So um, again, empowering people, uh, fellowship and, uh, and better liturgy. Thanks, Casey. Thank you, Father Rudiman, uh, so much. And uh, thanks for leaving me on the, uh, you know, controversial comment. I, I appreciate that. Um, that that'll time. be, a, yeah, that'll be a great way to lead into our discussion. And um, at this time, I'm going to just say thank you to everybody who is uh, with us here on Facebook Live. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, if you are interested in joining this conversation with us, Come over here on the Zoom side. Um, I've left the registration link there um, in the comment section on Facebook. So please join us. And uh, I appreciate all of you um, just giving us your time uh, currently. So uh, just give me a moment and I'm going to end our live. So thank you, everyone, and have a good evening on Facebook. OK. So um, we are now going to have a few moments of personal reflection. And uh, yeah, just one more time, uh, Father Rudiman, thank you so much. And uh, I really do appreciate the ministry that you do uh, for us uh, with the Air Force. And I'm sure um, some of the joint experience that you've had as well. So let me bring up um, our questions and I will offer everyone uh, about three minutes um, just to have some personal silence and um, I'll have some music playing in the background so that um, if you need a little bit of that concentration, um, you can have that. And um, I will also uh, stop the recording here. Um, so let me do that.